So in the late 70s, the dulcimer had its widest audience. It was embraced by hippies and the counterculture. In the last episode of the TV series Mad Men, which is a series about the advertising world in the 1960s, the main character, Don Draper, went to a self-realization retreat in Big Sur. Don attended this retreat to learn how to express his inner emotions. This retreat center looks like the Esalen Institute. At the end of the retreat, he trumped up the famous Coke commercial. Well, at this point, you're probably wondering what this has to do with the dulcimer, right? <laughs> well, during one of his, the self-realization exercises, Don walked around the, wor the workshop room with other participants, listening to the teacher who asked the participants to get in touch with their feelings. And during the workshop, there was a dulcimer in the corner. <laughs> now, the set designer didn't just place that dulcimer there accidentally. In the late 60s and early 70s, the dulcimer was a symbol of self-expression for the counterculture. So that set designer knew what, they were, what he or she was doing. So, well, so how did the dulcimer that came from the Appalachian Mountains played by the hillbillies become a tool of self-expression uh, self for the hippies on the West Coast. Well, in many ways, it started with this man, Richard Farina. He brought the dulcimer to a whole new level of playing by incorporating world rhythms and the music he wrote on his dulcimer and writing topical songs using his dulcimer. Richard and his wife Mimi first their first album was called Celebrations for a Gray Day. In this groundbreaking album, Richard played many instrumentals on the dulcimer that showcased his progressive, distinctive style. On the album are rock tunes, political and topical tunes, which had never been played on a dulcimer before. Richard's style of playing deeply affected hippies on the West Coast. After hearing him play, they wanted to play the dulcimer. So we're going to play you another tune written by this man, Richard Farina. And, well, actually written by Richard and um, his sister-in-law, Pauline, which is, I don't know if you know the family very well, but that's actually Joan Baez's sister. So, um, okay. And it's called Pack Up Your Sorrow. If you know the tune, please sing along.
They're two, they were two uh, dulcimer rebuilders and players. Here's Robert and Albert with Joellen at one of the early gatherings. At KG, many musical genres were played, such as world music, rock and roll, jazz, swing, and original singer-songwriter music. So I'm going to play a clip of Robert Force playing his original tune called Well End. Uh, we filmed him playing this at the Kindred Gathering uh, in 2011. earlier about this uh, documentary film that Wayne and I made called Hearts of the Dulcimer, and it's about the West Coast Dulcimer revival. So if you want to learn more about this period, um, we have DVDs here for sale afterwards if you're interested, um, and, or you can get one on our website. The Dulcimer was easy to play, and for hippies it was something different. Some countercultural youth grabbed onto the Dulcimer and made it their own. So um, we have a clip here from our documentary, Hearts of the Dulcimer, that's about the counterculture. I think the dulcimer is appealing to the counterculture in California, partly because it, it, it represents something that is very different from mainstream, consumerist, materialistic, industrialized America. It still does carry the kind of the mythology of the mountains as being a simple back to nature place where people are resourceful and live a very holistic life. I think the country was different uh, and it was easy to make and easy to play. You could become a luthier quickly and you could become a pretty decent player quickly and I think because you could improvise easily, you could make stuff up we uh, racked our brains, you know, what are we going to call it? We, should we call it the Rug Brothers? I don't know, people might think we make carpets, you know. <laughs> so we were struggling, and this was in the uh, late 60s, as he said. So it was the dawning of the age, where he is. And so I came up with, how about we take your birth sign, Capricorn, and mine, Taurus, and we hook them together. In 69, we launched Capricorn Taurus, and uh, that's how it all started. We were hippies, um, long hair and uh, granny dresses, and um, we were living that lifestyle. And we ended up living in Ben Lomond. We uh, were driving down Highway 9 a lot, and I saw the Capitore store and wondered what it was, and I stopped in and saw they were making dulcimers. I thought to myself, this really fits my ideal. There was kind of a communal air about it, and I thought Michael and Howard were great and it was a wonderful opportunity and I think I came back every week for six weeks till they finally gave in and hired me. <laughs> what it sort of evolved into was more of a cooperative kind of a setting. A lot of the people that we worked with also lived with us in the communal household. We were attempting to be into sort of cosmic consciousness and that was to uh, be doing business without the normal um, capitalistic attitude about it. In other words, we were building dulcimers not so much to amass a fortune as to uh, do something that we felt good about doing and at the same time make a living. We would frequently have lunch down by the riverbank and talk about making the world a better place and how what we were doing was a step in that direction, providing music to the world. It appealed to my very core. was not left out of the scene. <laughs> in, this, in this same spirit, a group living in Falk 
Creek on a farm called Livewood also made dulcimers, and this is from Gene Ritchie's book. Um, so they were, they were well known. Many dulcimer recordings were made during this time period, and this is one of the early seminal West Coast dulcimer recordings. This label, Kicking Mule, produced many dulcimer recordings in a wide variety of styles. This was a time of exploration, playing genres such as jazz, swing, world music, rock and roll, and traditional music. Dulcimer fever also reached across the Atlantic. One of the most famous British dulcimer players was Roger Nicholson. Roger wanted to show the dulcimer's range, so on his LP called None Such for Dulcimer, he played Baroque to more traditional drum bass pieces, reflecting modal and Eastern influences. He even wrote a requiem for Richard Farina. And Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones played dulcimer on several Rolling Stone recordings. One of the most well-known songs he played on dulcimer is, anybody, anybody? Lady Jane. You can find that on YouTube. In the American South, the dulcimer started becoming more popular. Dulcimer recordings also started popping up, and here's one of them, the Simmons family from Arkansas. And Edsel Martin built his own dulcimer and is known for his finger-picking style. Dulcimer bands integrated dulcimer with other acoustic folk music, other, uh, other folk instruments. So by the end of the 70s and into the early 80s, dulcimer was the hippest thing around. But as soon as it got popular, there was a decline in interest. 